Hello, everyone. I'm Tom Ferry with the Sports and Society Program at the Aspen Institute. Welcome to the latest event in our Future of Sports series, in which we peer into the crystal ball as best we can and with thought leaders and explore emerging ideas or themes in sports. We do so always with an eye toward inspiring solutions that can help sports serve the public interest, the mission of our program. Today's conversation is on the future of U.S. soccer with U.S. Soccer Federation President Cindy Parlo Cohn. What story can be told by the 2026 FIFA World Cup co-hosted in the U.S., Mexico, and Canada? That may seem like a long way off, but the biggest tournament in sports will be here sooner than you think. It's also a North Star, an opportunity to chart a course and dream a bit about what soccer can be in this country and the contribution that it can make to the vitality of the nation. Fun fact, worldwide, there are 3.5 billion fans of soccer. Basketball, baseball, the NFL, and college football combined have 1.3 billion. So the World Cup is no small opportunity when it comes to sports diplomacy. Ideas about who Americans are, the values we embody, and what we are capable of are shaped in no small measure by how our people play together, how we solve problems with balls at our feet. Getting it right at the grassroots level is essential. Making the game accessible to any kid who wants to play and helping each child develop their human and athletic potential through sport is foundational. It's why our program invited the Federation to participate in Project Play 2024, a roundtable of leading organizations that develops opportunities to build healthy children and communities through sports. Like other members, the Federation makes a financial donation to, to help Aspen conduct research, facilitate communication, and identify mutually reinforcing actions. Today's conversation goes beyond, that, goes beyond the youth piece. It includes an exploration of the opportunities and challenges facing the national teams, including a lawsuit by members of the U.S. women's team related to compensation for their participation on that team. A federal judge last year dismissed the claim, ruling that it lacked merit to proceed to trial. But the players are appealing and also pressing their case in the court of public opinion, most recently in the HBO, HBO Max film, LFG. Moderating today's conversation is Kendall Baker, sports editor with Axios, our partner on the Future of Sports series. Kendall's daily newsletter is well-read and widely respected throughout the industry, a comprehensive yet quick and consistently fair review of news and issues in sports. Aspen has put no guardrails on his conversation with Cindy, and the Federation has not been privy to the questions he will ask, respecting Aspen's editorial independence. This interview is all Kendall's. We invite your participation as well. We'll leave plenty of room at the end of the hour for Q&A. If you have a question for Cindy, please submit it in the Q&A function on Zoom. We'll try to get as many of the questions, get to, get to as many of the questions as we can. Over to you, Kevin. Thank you, Tom. Um, and Cindy, thank you so much for joining us. Where, where, are you, uh, where are you beaming in from? Oh, thanks for having me. I am coming in from Park City, Utah. Very nice. What, what, what brings you out there? Um, my husband's side of the family, um, a lot of his aunts and uncles live here. So with the pandemic, obviously we haven't seen them for quite some time. So we're out here visiting them as well as enjoying the beautiful mountains. Very nice. Well, thank you so much for joining us again. I'm in DC where it's 97 degrees, I believe. So uh, a little jealous of that, but quick bio on Cindy, just before we begin for, for those um, who are extremely familiar with her background. Cindy is a, a member of the National Soccer Hall of Fame and played for the U.S. Women's National Team from 1996 to 2004. She was a member of the historic 99 FIFA uh, World Cup championship team and also won two Olympic gold medals in 96 and 2004. Um, her 75 international goals ranks eighth all time in U.S. history. Uh, today, she's obviously president of the U.S. Soccer Federation as we covered. She's the first woman to serve in that role and she was elevated from VP last year after Carlos Cordero, Cordero resigned amid the turmoil of the lawsuit that Tom referenced at the top. So Cindy, um, you know, definitely excited to cover these issues. We're gonna go pretty broad here, but I did wanna start with LFG, the documentary that, that Tom uh, alluded to and kind of the state of equal pay, equal pay, which I imagine is a topic on most people's minds. Um, for those who haven't seen it, the film's basically a behind the scenes look at the, at the lawsuit that, that you know, was filed in the buildup to the 2019 World Cup, one that continues today. 
Um, U.S. soccer did not participate in the film, and I wanted to ask you if you could speak to that and maybe use this opportunity to uh, kind of respond to what the film says. Yeah, well, thanks. Um, so we were approached by the filmmakers um, what felt like as an afterthought because it was at the very end of their filmmaking process. And it was just really clear to us that the filmmakers wanted a one-sided movie. Um, and due to the approach that they took, um, we felt like there was no other reasonable choice but to re reluctantly and respectfully decline to participate. Um, but the, regardless, you know, the movie is a lot of the past and, and I'm really focused on the future and moving our games forward. You know, uh, we've spoken a lot about this federation being a new federation. Like there's a lot of new faces. Um, I'm about a little over a year into my presidency. Our CEO is a little bit over a year into his CEO position as well as new leadership throughout the organization. So, um, we're not really looking back, we're looking forward and how can we bridge the gap? How can we bring both the men's and the women's boys and girls side of the game forward um, and make it the preeminent sport in the US? And before we do move on to kind of that bigger picture mindset in terms of the equal pay conversation, which does continue, um, what do you think, and it, it's a complex issue, I think, you know, as I think most people would agree as we've followed it in the news, it's, you know, comparing compensation is, is complicated because each team has their own different CBA. Um, you have the FIFA payout piece, which is also complicated. So un unless you really dedicate time to understanding it, it's very hard to get your, wrap your hands around the, the, the complexities of it. Um, because of that, what do you think has gotten most lost in the, conver in the conversation around this, if anything? Do you think there's any kind of uh, misconceptions out there uh, in terms of where you guys stand? Yeah, well, I, I think a few things. Um, first and foremost, in case people on this on, on this call haven't heard me say it before, um, I am 100% committed to equal pay, and everyone at U.S. Soccer is 100% committed to equal pay. Um, the challenges for us are the differences in FIFA World Cup prize money. Um, the vast majority, the 66 million that the women's national team. Um, is litigating over is the difference in the FIFA World Cup prize money between the men's World Cup and the women's World Cup. Um, now, while I agree that the prize money gap should be eliminated or at least reduced, it's not something that U.S. soccer controls and to ask us to make up that difference is just untenable and would likely bankrupt the federation. Um, on the other side of it, I mean, you mentioned the CBAs. Um, our men and women have different CBAs. They have different player associations um, or unions that negotiate separately. Um, as U.S. soccer, we would love to negotiate together. Um, but with the different, but so far, the men and the women haven't done that and haven't wanted to do that. Um, so we continue to move forward and have to negotiate these CBAs separately. Um, but on, in the perfect world for U.S. soccer, they would negotiate together. So we'd have one deal for both teams. And for those who aren't following this, like where, where do things currently stand in terms of kind of the lawsuit? And just, yeah, just where are we right now? So as you, everyone will recall, the as you mentioned in the open, the judge dismissed um, the case um, and then but didn't rule on the Title VII claims. And so we worked together with the women's PA and their lawyers um, to settle all the Title VII claims, which we did and the judge accepted. So that opened up the avenue for the women to appeal um, the earlier decision on equal pay, which they have done. And so the next step is to file briefs. Um, the women will need to file their beliefs, I believe on July 23rd. Got it. Um, so I imagine we'll get some questions on this in the Q&A. So I do want to pivot into kind of zooming out, as you said, and talking about women's soccer as a whole and how the U.S. can hopefully be a leader there. Uh, the U.S. soccer has stated that your main focus is, quote, getting a resolution with the U.S. women's national team and then joining arms with the U.S. women's national team to drive women's soccer forward across the world. H how do you envision that? I and mean, when you say driving it forward, what are we doing now? What can we do? I mean, this is really a place where U.S. can lead internationally. Yeah, and, and as you said, our women's national team players are household, household names with influence that just extends well beyond the sport, you know, and their forceful advocacy for gender equity and social justice has really elevated the public conversation 
and our national consciousness and honestly my consciousness about these critical issues in ways that I can never imagine during my time on the field, which is fantastic. So the women on the national team from my group that went through to this current group continue to push the envelope, which I think is great. Um, and U.S. soccer has been on the forefront of pushing women's soccer forward. Um, and I think we had a lot of um, help with like things like Title IX that helped push the U.S. to the forefront early on. Um, and the women have just continued that. So for me, my vision, um, obviously, I wanted to resolve the litigation with the women's national team so that we can work together to move forward. But the vision... Um, that I see is I think the women's game is uniquely positioned um, to literally change the world. Um, if we can around the world give girls a place to play soccer and access to our game um, here at home in the US but also globally and raise this game um, and to have equal investment in the girls and the boys game, the men's and the women's game and work with the other member associations around the world and work with FIFA to equalize prize money, equalize investment. Um, I, I, I really believe in, I know it sounds a little bit cliche, but I really believe that we can work to change the world. And just to give people a sense of the kind of global women's soccer landscape, I think there's like over 200 federations. Like how many of those even have, um, you know, regular programming? How many of those have women's teams? I mean, where, 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 what is kind of the state of play of women's soccer around the world? Yeah, it's obviously not where we want it to be. There, there's not, um, we're not at the numbers where we, where we see the national teams that are have year round programming like we see with the top teams in the world. Um, but we are making progress. Um, FIFA has done a, a lot of great work investing um, up to a billion dollars in the girls and women's side of the game, which is fantastic. And we are seeing other member associations invest in the girls and women's game, um, but we need everyone. Um, right now, I think it's about half of them um, I would have to look at the most recent figures, but I think it's around half of the member associations um, have women's programming that um, that are at least getting together three or four times a year. Got it. Um, it's a it's a big summer for for both the men's and women's teams. <clears throat> Obviously, the women in the Olympics, the men in uh, World Cup qualifying, Gold Cup, tons of tons of things going on this summer. Um, I wanted to talk about. Let's shift to the men's team real quick before we come back to the women's. Uh, you know, a big story in the past year is kind of how many young U.S. men's players are in the Champions League, uh, playing at top clubs around the world. How important, I mean, I think we can all kind of understand, it clearly is important, but just, just how big is that for the growth of, the, uh, of soccer, you know, domestically? I mean, it's huge. Um, the success of our senior national teams is critical um, to our overall mission to grow the game in the U.S. Um, and I and I think our men are a great example. You know, I th I, when Greg Berhalter came in, he had a few goals that he wanted to achieve, and one of those goals was to expand the player pool. Um, and we're seeing that. Um, now with Nations League and now the Gold Cup, because it's not gonna be 18 players that help us qualify for the World Cup. It's gonna take a much larger number than that. So um, I think we're all seeing uh, the expansion of our men's national team and how exciting our young players are. I mean, it's just a really, really fun time to watch the men's national team right now. Um, just so talented. And I think the other thing is um, the brand of soccer that they're playing, you know, possession style, building out of the back, breaking lines. Um, I just, I really love watching them play and they're exciting to play. And I think every fan is now tuning in and, and, and figuring this out. And so we have great aspirations for, our men's team too. Um, we've put it out there. Our goal is for them to consistently be in the top eight in the world. And I think for a lot of folks, particularly those who don't follow soccer closely, the fact that there were so many young Americans in Champions League, so you're kind of caught them off guard. Like, where did this come from? What's going on? I mean, outside of the kind of standard, it's a golden generation, you know, answer. Like, what do you think got us here in recent years? And what do you, you know, what can we learn from that? Or what, what can we kind of keep doing going forward? Because I do think a lot of people or don't really have a tangible answer for like, how did this happen? How do we, how do we all of a sudden have, I think it was, you know, six players in Champions League when in the past we've rarely even had one. 
Yeah, well, I think you have to give a lot of credit to those players as individuals, right? Um, having um, played the game at a high level myself, I know the work and the sacrifice that it takes to reach the highest levels of the game. Um, so I think first and foremost, we have to give the players credit, but then also um, to the members of U.S. soccer who help develop these players. Um, I, I think we are reaching new levels. I think U.S. soccer is doing a good job with the coaching education um, and then the development academy that we had, which unfortunately due to COVID, we shut down. Um, but I but I, what I love seeing is our members are now um, picking up those standards and carrying on through different programming, um, whether it's MLS Next, um, ECNL, or on the girls' side, the GA. Um, so, so it's really a product of us training better. And then the players, you know, you, it can't go, I can't say it enough. I mean, it, we have to give the players that are making it all the kudos in the world because they're the ones that have done the work. They believed in themselves. They've all had adversity and they've dealt with it and to be the players that they are. And some of them at such a young age, is just so incredible to see. And shifting to, to the women's team, obviously continuing to dominate, I believe 44 match unbeaten streak, second longest ever, not bad. Um, the, the one thing that has been covered, however, is, is the team does still lack diversity. And we're going to get into more um, youth soccer later, uh, which I think is probably a root cause of this, but how do you think that, you know, are, are you guys uh, on top of that issue? Is that, is that um, on your radar? How does the roster look by, more diverse in the future? And what, you know, what do you think are the root causes of that? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely on our radar. And this is a huge focus for me, not just at the women's national team, but the women's national team is a reflection of our youth landscape. So the question more is how do we change the dynamic at the youth landscape? Um, and this is, is one of the reasons why we, we joined Project Play, but also um, another thing that I've implemented is we're doing a nationwide study on soccer specifically in why minorities aren't choosing soccer. What are those barriers? And then how can we, and that's we collectively, not just the Federation, um, but everyone collectively work together to remove those barriers so that every kid has access to our game. Um, I was at um, a meeting with this amazing woman, Adrian at Nike, um, and she said something that really resonated with me. Um, and it was that we need to shift our thinking to that sport is a birthright. And so how does that change how we think about our sport, um, soccer, if we think that it is a birthright? And how do we make sure that every kid that wants to have access to our game has it? And um, as Tom mentioned, the top 2026 20, World Cup, huge deal, kind of a North Star in a way, if we're looking ahead at kind of what story do we want to be able to tell when the, you know, the eyes of the world are on us. Um, how do we make sure that the, the story we're telling about U.S. soccer four years from now, five years from now, is, is, is a positive one? I mean, wh what are the kind of immediate things that you think need to happen over the next four years for us to get to a place where we want to be? Yeah, well, I think for, for our men's team, we need to continue on the progression that we're on. Um, the women's team continue to win everything. Um, hopefully we'll continue that with the Olympics that start up here later this month. Um, but you, you know, the World Cup is huge. Um, and just because it's the men's World Cup, I don't want people to think that it only benefits the men's and boys side of the game. Um, we're expecting to see huge growth on the girls and women's side of the game, as well as um, disability programs, futsal, um, beach. So the, two, the 2026 World Cup um, is going to be unbelievable for soccer in the US, not just US soccer, for soccer in the US. Um, 94 World Cup is still the most successful World Cup to date. Um, and I think 2026 is going to blow it out of the water. And, you know, in terms of when we talk about, uh, you know, what story we want to tell, um, not that the, you know, men's and women's teams aren't working together and aren't united, but there is a sense that maybe they could be even more so um, kind of this, you know, is there, is there any effort there being made, whether it's kind of more ex exhibitions together or, I mean, what is kind of, kumbaya between the men's and the women's teams look like, you know, as that, I imagine, you know, it's obviously men's World Cup, but we want to, you know, we want to look as unified as possible. What, do you think there needs to, anything needs to happen there? 
Well, I, I know for sure that our women's players are cheering on the men's players and vice versa. Um, so I think a lot of, I want to make that very clear is that there's a lot of support going both ways. Um, I think the challenges are um, more on the business side of the game, right? There's this huge difference in FIFA World Cup prize money and how could the men's team help equalize it, right? And join forces with the women. Um, so can we get around the table together, you know, and talk it out and figure out how even if FIFA isn't going to equalize the World Cup prize, prize money now, um, how can we as a federation, how can the, the men's and women's team as a federation help us um, to equalize it among our two teams um, at the senior level? Um, but I know there's a lot of support on both sides and there'll be a lot of cheering each other on. And I, I think as we move towards 2026 as well, there'll be a lot of things that our men and women will be doing together in terms of advertising and pushing the game forward. Um, but I, I think another one of the issues is just this litigation, right? It's hanging over our heads. And I think everyone will be in a better place when we can come to a resolution on that. And that way we can shift our focus back to where it should be on growing the game and winning. And um, you, you had mentioned this before. So before we get into youth uh, development, I wanted, to, I wanted to ask you this. You had mentioned futsal and beach. In, in my research, I, did, I guess I hadn't realized how many disciplines there are. Like, can you go through that for folks who maybe don't know how many different versions of soccer we have going on? Yeah, so U.S. soccer has currently 22 um, national teams. So we have beach soccer, um, para, which is our Paralympic team, futsal, and then our youth national teams, plus our senior men's and women's national team. And we're soon going to be adding other national teams as well. Um, so adding our beach women's team, uh, futsal women's team, um, possibly blind, power, deaf men and women. Um, so a lot of disability as well as other programs like futsal and beach being added. So um, there's a lot of different ways to access our game. Um, and I, and I think adding in beach and futsal and bringing that more to the forefront, I think is, was really great for our game because it's an exciting style of soccer, um, with five V five, you know, um, smaller numbers, um, you need a court, it can be indoor or outdoor, it could just be a gym floor. So just in talking about access to our game, I think futsal is, is a great avenue to do that. And I'm, I'm honestly just curious. I don't know if you know off the top of your head, like where do we rank? in those disciplines are we how, how good are our teams so both our beach men and futsal men's team just qualified for the world cups um which will take place in august and september um beach is in august and futsal is in september um so i'm not sure where their exact ranking is um but hopefully we can perform well in those tournaments awesome um and yeah so sh shifting to youth uh, participation i think this is an issue kind of across the board that people are becoming more and more aware of regardless of sport, I think it impacts everybody. And there's a ton of different, you know, things to look at. Um, so I guess I wanted to start with, with pay to play, which seems to be an issue across the board, impact soccer uh, in particular, just because there's so many youth uh, soccer programs across the country. How big of an issue is that? What, what, how, what are you guys viewing there in terms of just people simply being priced out of sports at a young age? Um, and before they even get a chance to really fall in love with it. Yeah, so I think a pay to play is definitely one barrier, but it's definitely, it's not the only barrier. And I don't think it's the barrier for entry into our game because there's a lot of recreational programs um, that are pretty inexpensive um, for the most part. So I think it's expanding those programs because those types of programs, the park and rec programs, um, or just the, the rec program that's coming out of our club levels, um, those were the hardest hit by COVID. Um, and specifically with our parks and recs, not only were the programs hit by COVID, but then budget cuts. So there's a real concern and something that's really concerning for me is programs like that, that may not come back post COVID. So how do we as a federation, along with our members and everyone else, um, ensure that these type of recreational programs come back? Because um, as a federation, we're not just focused on our national teams. You know, we, we want people to have access to our game because we know what playing 
uh, a team sport like soccer can do for a young child. Um, I know I'm the person I am today and the leader I am today because of my experiences through sport, um, most specifically soccer. Um, so to give that opportunity to every kid that wants it, um, we have to make that a focus. And um, another issue, obviously, we'll, I'll just kind of go down the line of all the issues that everybody has kind of brought to the surface around these sports. COVID uh, uh, was, I think, in a way, kind of exacerbated uh, current issues. Did you guys, were you guys tracking anything there in terms of participation or anything coming out of the pandemic in terms of maybe part participation being higher? I mean, what, what, what's happening there? Well, it's definitely coming back. Um, will we reach pre-pandemic levels? I hope so. Um, but like I said before, you know, there's the numbers that we track from our members, but then there's numbers outside of that, um, like the recreational programs um, with your local Parks and Rec or the YMCA and such, um, that we're just not sure um, where their numbers will come back. And so that's the base of our sport. So that's where the real concerning thing is for me, um, when I'm not being president, you know, I'm a youth soccer coach, so I see it firsthand. Um, so that is where we, I think we need to focus and how do we get kids, um, either back into our game or starting our game at the youngest levels. And then another thing, this is again true across sports, but I've seen it in particular kind of about, about soccer, often from folks who maybe lived abroad and then moved here um, in terms of kind of how we're teaching soccer to our, to our young kids. But bad, bad coaching across the board seems to be, I mean, there have been surveys kind of, why did your child drop sports? You know, didn't like their coach or their coach was mean or just what simply was not a good coach. There's been, you know, there's an, a new app called Mojo that's kind of trying to bring technology to that and provide a technological solution to help people be better coaches. Um, what, what, what's your take on that? Just kind of coaching, you, you mentioned you're, you're, you are a coach yourself. Like, what can you tell us about that? Yeah, well, I, I think... I think U.S. soccer has done a lot of work and made a lot of progress in this area and just trying to improve the quality of, of coaching, even at the, the lowest grassroots level. Um, I think the chat, one of the challenges that we face um, is just, it's very American to want to win, you know, and everyone wants to win. They want to be on a team that wins. Um, and I feel like at times coaches are worried so much about the outcome of the game that they lose um, focus on why kids play this game. You know, th they miss out on the fun. Um, so I think we need to make fun a real focus of our game um, and continue the coach education. Um, you know, I think our sport has an issue that I don't necessarily see in other sports. Um, it's either you're moving up the competitive ladder, so to speak, or you move out. Um, so this move up or move out mentality, I, I think we've got to shift the thinking there um, and just help kids find a place where they can compete and be competitive and be OK with being at that level, rather, regardless of the color of the team or the name of the team that they're on. Um, just find a place to enjoy the game and play it. And um, this is an interesting topic in, in terms of soccer specifically, because another issue around youth sports in, in recent years that's kind of gaining steam is this idea of specialization um, happening too early in many cases, kids getting burned out by the time they get to college because they've been focusing on one sport since they were like 10 years old, um, leading to injuries because of just kind of repetitive use in the same bones same muscles. Um, the flip side of that is you look at the kind of the international soccer landscape and the best countries you know, kids start playing soccer, focusing on soccer young, they're in development academies. H how do you balance, you know, the U.S. obviously wanting to compete with the best countries in the world in the soccer field without maybe, I don't know, losing something along the way? You, you talked about just not, you know, forcing win winning too early and kind of just focusing on access and participation more. H how do you balance those two things? Yeah, I, I think what you're speaking at is the early professionalization, right? right? Um it's one thing if a kid decides to specialize early, um, that's their choice. I played multiple sports. That's what I chose to do. Um, but I think the bigger challenge, the bigger challenge facing us is the early professionalization, um, which, which we have talked about, you know, kids are not small adults, they're kids um, and they're developing um, and they need to be in developmentally appropriate environments um, and I keep coming back to this word, it has to be fun. 
you know, I played the game at the highest level. And I can tell you that at every level I was having fun because this is a game. It has to be fun. Now, granted, not every training session was fun. I'll give you that. Um, but for the most part, playing this game um, from the youth level all the way up to the international and professional level, it was fun. And so we've got to make sure that we're make, these kids are having fun with our game and experience, experimenting with our game and learning through our game. Um, and not just learning the X's and O's of soccer and different tactics, but learning all the life lessons that we know that team sports can teach young kids. Awesome. Uh, apparently, <clears throat> apparently we have a ton of great questions. So I'm going to uh, shift it back to Tom to handle those real quick. I'll stay on if we want to bounce off those questions a little bit. But yeah, let's let's take those questions, uh, Tom. Yeah, okay. thank you, Sid. And thank you, Kendall. Uh, great conversation. Yeah, we're getting uh, hit with a, a lot of questions about the FIFA prize money, about uh, grassroots influence, what can be done. So let me just sort of try and bucket some of these here. So building on what you were just talking about, um, City, I think it'd be helpful for people to know I mean, how does the feder what what is the federation and how does it exert its influence? Right. I mean, and what are its channels? Is it youth coaching? Is it setting program standards? Is it uh, advocacy? What what? How do we understand what your sphere of influence might be and what your priority? Yeah. So let me try to to break it down for you. So U.S. Soccer is a member of Concacaf, which is our confederation. Um, but also a member of FIFA. So we're one of 211 um, member associations um, throughout the world. Um, so we have one vote um, just like any other of the 211 countries. So our influence at FIFA is one of 211. Um, so I think that helps you. And then on the other side, we're also under um, USOPC, um, and which is under the IOC, the International Olympic Committee. So um, we have a lot of different people that we answer to and have to follow their bylaws and statutes. Gotcha. And your channels of influence and what your is it, is it coach training? Is it program standards? What's in, in the grassroots? What's your where do you see your sphere of influence? Yeah. So I think in, in a multiple ways. One. So we're doing the study you know, so education. So what are the barriers to entry into our game and how do we work together to remove those barriers? So that's one, one area, coaching education for sure. Um, we have a grassroots course that um, is exactly for that, for the grassroots level. Um, so that mom or dad that's coaching their kid and wants to, to learn more about the game in order to be a better coach and create a good environment. Um, and then also we have these innovate to grow grants where we, our members can apply for grants in order to, um, if they have a creative way to help grow the game or increase access to the game. Got it. Good. Uh, Dave Robinson um, said, thank you, Cindy, for mentioning disability. Is that survey of minorities also going to touch on disabled minority athletes and their barriers to participate? Yeah, so it's minorities of all types, not just um, racial um, or socioeconomic. Um, it's looking at the LGBTQ, um, the disability, um, every aspect of the game and every type of minority. How do we make sure that this game is for everyone and everyone sees themselves in our game? Mm -hmm. Got it. And also getting, like I said, a number of questions about the FIFA prize money. This one's from Grant Wall. Uh, football with Grant Wall. A lot of folks on this uh, on this webinar are familiar with Grant and his terrific work. He says, "Thanks for doing this, Cindy. Would it be possible to go into more detail about how you and the federation came to the conclusion that FIFA should eliminate the World Cup prize money gap between men and women? Uh, for how long and in what ways has U.S. Soccer been pushing FIFA to eliminate that prize money gap, both privately?" and publicly, and what more do you think U.S. soccer can do in this area moving forward? Yeah, so I, so thanks, Grant. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of things that we're doing and trying to do. Um, so it's kind of a top-down and a bottom-up approach at the same time. So top-down is working with um, FIFA um, and the president of FIFA, Gianni Infantino, um, 
to, to want to do this, to try to work, to move toward this? Is it going to happen tomorrow? I don't think so, but can we create a pathway to equalizing not only the FIFA World Cup prize money, because I know that's where the litigation is focused, but equalize investment um, in every aspect of the game um, on the boys and the girls side, uh, men and women's side. So there, and then the bottom up approach is obviously we've seen great value in the women's game here in the US, and as has most of Europe as well, um, the game is growing. And so helping other member associations to see the value of the women's game and the girls game and how it can not only help them as a federation, but can help their country be better by investing in girls and women. So, um, so it's kind of the top down, bottom up approach. Um, and obviously this is easier if I have our women's national team helping me do this, um, which obviously the litigation makes things challenging um, in that respect. So I think things will, would be much easier if we can find a resolution, hopefully outside of court um, with the women, like I said, to put the focus back on the game and growing the game, um, not just here at home, but globally. Um, like I said in the beginning, I really think the women's game is uniquely positioned um, to quite literally change the world. And I know some people are probably chuckling at me saying that, but I really feel that we can do this if we have a large group working together, that we can really change the world and change the lives of girls um, and women around the world. Got a couple of questions and they're kind of related. One comes from The Economist, Andrew, Andy Zimbalist. Um, and, and the second is from Lynn Burling Manuel, who's been involved obviously with uh, uh, youth coaching in soccer. So Andy says, please clarify the use of FIFA money. FIFA may pay much more for the men, but as I understand it, the payment is made to U.S. soccer, which then has discretion on its use. Is this correct? So the, the FIFA prize money comes into U.S. soccer, and then we distribute it based on the CBAs that are negotiated with the men's and the women's um, players associations. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. Um, good. Uh, and now the women are, are uh, uh, going to be negotiating their contract pretty soon as well, right? What's, what's the timeline on that? And, and given all this conversation, are they in a position to negotiate a better deal next time? Well, obviously the focus for the women right now are, is bringing home the gold from the Olympics. Um, so um, those negotiations will likely start um, post Olympics sometime because their CBA is up at the end of this year. Um, and with the men, we're currently negotiating right now. And wherever that lands, we will turn around and offer that to the women's team and they will have the option to accept or reject it. Got it, good. Um, also a question regarding uh, US soccer's decision to sever business ties with Soccer United Marketing. Why go it alone on the sponsorship side? And I'd be curious to know as well, what, what kind of opportunities does that open up uh, over the next five years or so? Yeah. Um, well, first of all, let me say that Soccer United Marketing has been a great partner with U.S. soccer. They've helped us to grow the game where it is today. Um, but we felt as a federation that we've grown and evolved and that we are ready to take this on in-house um, and to have control of our sponsorship and media rights just opens up the door for us um, to to create a lot more opportunities for U.S. soccer and for our players, both as individuals and, and as teams. Um, and I think it open, opens up an opportunity for us uh, to expand our extended national team. So that was the like the para team, beach, futsal teams, um, and just to really grow the sport. Gotcha. Uh, question from Katrina Gallus from Canada. She said, how important is it to work cross border and bring both the USA and Canada forward together to create an aligned voice and point of view on these big topics and issues like pay equity, soccer participation, et cetera. 
it's huge. Um, and not just with Canada, but with, with everyone. Um, it's not about the US rising up and pushing everyone else down. Um, we want to raise, raise everyone up at the same time. Um, so obviously within our confederation of CONCACAF, but then also more globally um, within the entire con, uh, con global, you know, and, and trying to raise the level of the women's game everywhere. Um, Dennis Wong asks, uh, what is soccer doing and needs to do to attract the best athletes who might be attracted to other team sports such as football, basketball, and baseball? Yeah, I, this is a challenge that I think is uniquely American in that there are a lot of choices for young kids, um, which in one respect is great. You know, kids have a lot of different opportunities to find places where they can excel. Um, and I think we have to shift the focus um, and not just be looking for athletes, um, but for players, you know, um, continue to make sure that every kid growing up in our country um, sees themselves in our game, sees our game as an opportunity to them. Um, and this is a lot of the work that we're doing now um, in conjunction with some other of our members and um, the U.S. Soccer Foundation is to make sure that every kid growing up has access to our sport. So it's not um, just the, the rich white kids that are playing. We need everyone, um, regardless of ability, sexual or gender orientation, um, socioeconomic, racial background, what have you, um, that you feel comfortable joining our game. I actually have a follow-up to that, Cindy. Um, just curious, you know, it, it, because so many other sports and true for soccer too, it, in terms of, you know, how do you inspire kids to play? It's a lot of times it's kind of trickled down from the pro leagues. Right. You know, it, a lot of kids want to play football because they're, you know, they love Tom Brady or, you know, they want to play basketball because they love LeBron James. Like, I guess this is a good opportunity for you to maybe explain for folk, to folks, like, how do you guys work with MLS and where, where, where does their role in things like youth participation, how, what are they doing versus what you're doing? How are you guys working together? How do you, how do your roles differ there? Yeah, so it's not just MLS. Um, it's MLS, USL, NISA, NWSL on the women's side. Um, it's important for kids to grow up with aspirations of making it to the pros, um, right? Or to making it to one of our senior national teams. So that's a huge part in why kids choose to play a sport. Um, and MLS, as you mentioned, they have their youth program, MLS Next. Um, and a bunch of NWSL teams have academies underneath them um, and USL as well. So I think it's really important, um, especially with us having to um, close down our development academy, um, that our members are now taking on the responsibility of developing the youth, um, which has just been so great to see. And then, and then taking them taking on the standards that were in place with the development academy. So I think the future is really bright um, for soccer in the U.S. and U.S. soccer. Um, but is it perfect? No, we we still have a lot of work to do. Um, especially in the space of diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. Um, the uh, Jeff Perdome asks, can you be more specific about how U.S. soccer can help address the financial barriers for youth participation? As a nation, we are excluding a lot of talent by shutting out youth from low and even middle income families. I mean, is there, are there any policies? Is, are there any structural Mm, interventions that could be encouraged, whether it be competition structures. I mean, we need to go to, you know, elite teams when kids are in second grade that kind of price out other kids. I, is there anything that can be done in, in, to, to help that? Yeah, I think one of the challenges in soccer is that we, we kind of call it the alphabet soup of soccer because there's all these different acronyms for the different um, leagues and programs and stuff. And kids will drive past um, several other competitive teams because the, those teams don't play in the league that they play in. And so I think it's collectively working together and how do we um, de decrease the travel, right, of these, of these teams? How do we decrease the cost? Um, 
And then, I mean, it's, but it's not just the travel, the cost of uniforms, of club fees, um, all of these things factor in. And so I think it's all of us collectively working together. I know for me at my club, I actively work to find donors for scholarship money for kids that can't afford the game. Um, so I think it's doing things like that, um, on a small level, but then also on a macro level is finding ways that we can scholarship kids, um, at every level of the game, not just the elite kids, um, but at every level of the game to make sure that they all have access. You know, one of the greatest drivers of, uh, um, participation over the past hundred years was title nine, right? A, a simple act by the federal government says you cannot discriminate uh, in the provision of, of uh, sport experiences in schools. Um, I mean, is, is there, uh, in terms of closing that access gap, I mean, what you just talked about was, was clubs doing what they can to scholarship kids. But I mean, do you see any, I mean, would you like to see more support from the government in some way or another? Either it be non-discrimination statements about any kid from any background gaining access to sports, or is it funding, you know, additional funding streams through, I don't know, you know, legal, a chunk of legalized sports betting like we're seeing in New York or, or, or elsewhere. I mean, uh, what kind of help do you need to close that gap so it's not all on the local club to do it? Yeah, I think all of the things that you mentioned are key. Um, I'll go back to something that I said earlier is that if we shift our thinking to sport as a birthright or soccer as a birthright or whatever sport you're in, um, and you it, it kind of shifts your thinking on how would you proceed with that. And so it's not U.S. soccer alone. Um, it's everyone working together to find ways and problem solve ways that we can do this. Um, and a lot of focus has been on the pay to play. That's only one barrier, you know? And so how, what are the other barriers and how do we remove those other barriers as well? Um, so, I mean, that's one reason why I'm so excited about the study we're doing that will hopefully be out um, around September timeframe. Um, and we're planning on making it public to everyone so that everyone can learn what we're learning in real time and we can all work together um, to, to work to remove those barriers because I don't know that the barriers are isolated to soccer. I'm guessing that there's similar barriers to other sports as well. Um, so for me, it's not U.S. soccer forging ahead and doing this alone, which is one of the reasons why we joined Project Play. We've all got to work together um, if we really want to move sport forward. Gotcha. You know, and Rob Smith from the Youth Sports Collaborative Network, uh, building on that, said, um, who is doing the youth soccer evaluation and how can people submit their views on equity issues in youth soccer? And what is the timeline to have issued the evaluation publicly, which I think you just covered that last part of it, but. Yeah, uh, um, so we're working with a, a best in class consulting company to do uh, the study for us and to help us brainstorm ideas on how we can eliminate the barriers. So as soon as we can make that public, we will. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the advantages that the cider has is um, it's quite popular with, with Latino populations, right? So huge chunk of the U.S. population right now. So how, uh, Stephen Bloom asks, uh, looking at the future of soccer in the U.S., can you comment on key trends, demographic patterns, and other factors on the popularity of soccer in the U.S. compared to other professional sports? So, I mean, does soccer have more upside than these other sports, do you think, because it, it, you know, it, 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 it's popular with girls and boys and, you know, uh, across rate, you know, ethnic and racial identities? Yeah, I mean, I think there's huge up upside for this sport um, for all the reasons that you mentioned, but also our fan base is young and very tech savvy, uh, which I think it, it is the future of sport, you know, um, the technology that's coming into sport now. Um, so I think for all the reasons that you mentioned, plus those, um, there is such huge upside um, to the sport of soccer. Not to, not to be the, the negative guy, but I'm curious <laughs> on the flip side, what do you think are the challenges? I mean, because, you know, as, as just one off the top of my head, thinking about kind of bare bones of the sport, it's hard to kind of play like basketball. You go out with a ball, go to a hoop, you can shoot around by yourself. Kind of hard to play soccer by yourself. You can, 
But like, what are, what are some, like, if we're being honest, challenges that soccer has that maybe other sports don't that we have to maybe overcompensate for or think about creative solutions to? Yeah, I mean, this isn't necessarily specific to soccer, um, but we're seeing it. It's obviously a challenge that we're facing is the early attrition rate, especially among young girls from our sport. Um, so how do we address that, keep them in our game um, and keep them in sport in general? Um, the lack of access to our game, which is why we're doing the study. So that's how we're attacking that. Um, really working with the coaching community. Um, I know Lynn was on and, and had a question, but how do we work with our coaching community um, to make sure they're making every training session fun, the games are fun, um, and working with the parents to engage the parents on not putting too much pressure on their kids and um, not critiquing every movement that they make on the soccer field um, and just being supportive and loving parents um, as they grow and develop through our game. So those are the key ones. I think another um, area for U.S. soccer that we haven't done a good enough job in, and, and you mentioned it, um, is really bringing in the Hispanic community um, and, and wrapping our, our arms around it. I think we've done a better job on the boys and men's side of the game than we have on the girls and women's side of the game. And so how do we improve that and, re and really focus on that to, to bring that the large and growing Hispanic community that is loves this game um, under our umbrella? Yeah, uh, Diane uh, Scabuzo had a question. Um, a couple of people did just about sort of the structure, the disjointed structure of soccer in this country. Um, what she asked, what is the solution to the fractured landscape in youth soccer? And do you think it's a barrier to growing the game? And you got, of course, U.S. club soccer, U.S. youth soccer, AYSO, on and on and on, AAU, uh, you know, USSA. I mean, they're all over the place. But how do you how do you look at that? How do you look at that question? Um, in one respect, it's challenging because we have youth organizations that are competing against each other for players. Um, so that leads to the fracturing side. Um, but the positive side of it is that there's different pathways for young kids. Um, they don't have to be, if they're not happy in one organization or league or what have you, there are there are other opportunities where if it was just one, there's really nowhere for them to go. So um, there's both challenges and opportunities with the way our youth landscape is shaped up. Um, and more and more, um, many of our youth organizations are working together um, on, on things like diversity, equity, and inclusion on university, universal background checks and things like that. So we are seeing more collaboration in this respect, um, but it also is a challenge as, as the uh, listener mentioned. Yeah, you know, I mean, we're a, we're a soccer family. My son played college soccer and my youngest plays is a junior in high school, plays club soccer. And I would say, Cindy, we've had, um, you know, good experiences with coaches and good experiences with programs over time. I would say on balance, good. Uh, but there have been some less than good ones. What I find interesting is like there's no resource out there for parents to really evaluate the quality of a program when you think about whether to put your kid with this one or the other, right? So are the coaches in this particular club trained in the key competencies and working with youth? What is their policy around, you know, allowing kids to play other sports uh, or conflicts with family schedules or otherwise? It just, it seems to be a little bit of like a, you know, it's a marketplace that, that lacks the information for, for people to make quality decisions. Michael Lewis talked about that in my conversation with him at the Project Play Summit last year. Is there anything more that could be done to empower parents to make the best decisions for their kids? Yeah, I mean, I, I think U.S. soccer can play a role in this in one way, shape or form and just trying to educate the parents on what they should be looking for in a club and like what's kind of best practices, um, whether it's a club or a recreational program. Um, so I know there has been a lot of work done on this at U.S. Soccer with coaching education department, um, but we haven't rolled anything out on it yet. Gotcha. 
Okay, a couple more questions and then we'll, uh, we'll just wrap up here in the audience. Um, one person was asking about uh, academies and how they discourage or forbid kids from playing with their, their high school teams. Um, his point of view is it's an awful move that takes away a big slice from the high school experience and to what gain. You have a perspective on uh, this idea of, of if you're playing academy ball in high school, you cannot play uh, school sports as well? Well, the development academy is not around anymore, so it's not a problem <laughs> that we have to face any longer. Um, I, I think it was challenging for a lot of reasons. Um, just, I, I played high school soccer myself, so I understand um, the social aspect of the game. Um, and for some kids, the high school game is great for them because maybe on their academy team, um, they're a role player, but then moving to their high school team, while the level of soccer may be lower, um, they play a different role on that team and maybe they're a leader on that team. So in terms of child development, um, that's a positive. Um, but thankfully, uh, well, unfortunately, COVID did away with the development program, but on the positive side, if we're looking for positives, um, that's not an issue anymore. Yeah, uh, a couple of questions related to like local recreation, right? So like U.S. club soccer, uh, obviously caters to more of an elite, uh, elite player. Uh, but what can we do? And we've seen this in COVID as well. About you know, a lot of the youth soccer, a lot of youth sport environments come back. Certainly, the the pay for play environment. It's a struggle more with like the park and recs or the YMCA's or the, the local low cost in town recreations, which are, were already um, being diminished pre COVID. Is there anything more that US soccer can do to make those kind of environments, um, to build up those environments in town rec leagues? And sorry for my dog here. <laughs> Um, yeah, and I, and I think some things we're already doing, um, like the coach for community, um, which is free and entry level grassroots coaching. So providing better environments, um, the study that we're doing um, to figure out why kids aren't choosing it, uh, choosing soccer. And so what can we do to remove barriers to get kids either back in the sport or into the sport for the first time? Um, but then just be supporting more positive coaching behaviors, because if kids are um, in a positive environment, um, they're going to have a more enjoyable experience. So then they're going to draw their friends in, um, their younger siblings are going to join the game. So I think, um, getting back to what I said at the top of, of this interview is, is making sure that at every level of the game, but especially the youngest kids is that it's a positive environment and it is a fun environment for the kids to grow and develop. Is it right? I had one last um, In terms of kind of communication with the other federations, I met, you know, I met, we're, we're a leader uh, in, in the women's game. A lot of federations, I imagine, are kind of looking at us. Um, who are you guys, who do you guys look at? You know, how much communication is there? I mean, are, have you seen kind of, you know, some examples across the board of countries doing things in unique or creative ways that you kind of lean on? Or how, how much communication is done there on an international level? There's a lot and a lot of collaboration and learning um, from different countries. Um, obviously, uh, we are a leader, and especially on the women's side of the game. Um, so it's like, how can we use what we've done here to help grow the game globally, um, whether that's through coaching education or providing coaches or just in terms of programs that we've done and what have you. Um, so there's a lot of collaboration from us going out, but then also coming in, uh, we're constantly learning um, from other federations and what they're doing and, and, and making changes to make it fit um, us here in the U.S. So um, I would say there's a lot of collaboration among the different federations around the world. Terrific. Well, we should probably wrap up here. Thank you for the, the extended conversation, Cindy. Uh, we threw a lot at you from a lot of different angles and handled it very well. Really appreciate it. And thank you, Kendall, for the terrific moderating. And really everyone who joined us today and uh, submitted comments. Um, great conversation. And one that I hope really got everyone thinking about what's possible five years from now when the world comes to the U.S., um, a replay of today's conversation can be found at the link in the chat uh, and on the slide.
the next event in our Future of Sports series will be August 20th on a topic that we previewed at the Project Place Summit last year and actually Cindy uh, alluded to uh, in the conversation, which is children's rights and sports. What are those rights and how can a human rights frame be used to grow access and quality of experience throughout the vast disjointed landscape of youth sports in America? We'll have some exciting news to share by that time about a project we've been working on for months. Uh, keep an eye out for that and the speakers at our next event by following us on Twitter and Facebook at Aspen Instant Sports and by subscribing to our newsletter at as.pn or backslash pp subscribe. In the meantime, you can register for the event at the URL that uh, my team is uh, dropping into the chat. So happy summer all again. Thank you for joining us today and we'll see you again soon. Thanks, everyone.